right, so what we've been doing um, for the last few lectures here, going through today's, really the last lecture, going through the individual gastrointestinal hormones. Um, I'm picking up with coli, cysto, chimene today. Cholecystokinin, and CPK. So cholecystokinin is released in the presence of lipids. Uh, and will target to the mucosal cells of the small intestine. cells there that are called I cells. That will actually be targeted by CCK. They have a high concentration in the duodenal mucosa. Uh, duodenal mucosa, their I cells are well, relatively high. Uh, let me step back here one, one second because um, I, I didn't tell you correctly what's going on here. I said this was the target and what I meant was this was the, the origin. So the release in the presence of lipids, the SI mucosal cells uh, are the, the origin, specifically the eye cells have a high concentration in the blood of mucosa. Okay. So you eat a meal, have those high number of lipids that come in, enter into the duodenum, and we release cholecystokinin. Um, and so the, the actual targets here is to go to the gallbladder and induce gallbladder, um, gallbladder contraction. And I'm going to refer to this as the original causality because there's also some new things that happen as well. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, so the gallbladder is targeted by CCK, and CCK will induce contraction, um, which results in the emptying of the gallbladder. Now, the gallbladder is a storage bladder for bile. And so bile will be released from the gallbladder. It moves its, what makes its way through the common bile duct. Um, so in this picture here, the gallbladder would be present up in this area. It releases bile into the small intestine. Bile uh, is going to be an important uh, component of that metabolic uh, utilization of, um, uh, of lipids. So we know that that definitely happens, but there's also this effect that's known as a pancreozymin effect. Pancreozymin. And so the, the pancreozymin effect is this idea We had a hormone that was produced in the duodenum. That was observed to cause a pancreatic enzyme to be secreted. So basically what you're looking at here is kind of this amalgamation of pancreas and enzymes, the pancreozymin. So there's this hormone that was produced by the duodenal cells, and it was going to cause pancreatic enzyme um, secretion. But then it was also observed to do what we just talked about, 
that this pancreas binding can cause gallbladder contraction. And so the, the effect of CCK is actually um, kind of this dual effect where we have pancreatic enzyme secretion and the contraction of the gallbladder. And so originally pancreas, pancreozymin, now CCK. Kind of discovered um, independent of each other, this enzyme or this hormone being produced in the duodenal cells affecting the pancreas. They call it pancreozymin. The CCK is characterized, causes gallbladder contraction. They realized, oh, these two things are the same. Uh, in addition to the effects on both the pancreas and the, uh, the gallbladder, CCK actually also binds receptors in the hypothalamus. And is through this reception in the hypothalamus uh, implicated in satiety or the feeling of um, fullness after a meal or being satisfied after a meal. Um, if you have aberrant interaction or aberrant uh, <clears throat> receptor response, this is actually um, implicated in bulimia nervosa. Which results in a behavior known as binge, binge eating. Uh, binge eating is uncontrolled feeding, right? So you probably have all run into these terms before. Humans do this as well, but lab animals can have uncontrolled feeding. And then kind of the second part of this process of bulimia nervosa, after you binge, binge eat or uh, have this uncontrolled feeding, you induce some sort of abnormal method to combat the weight gain. So some examples of abnormal methods, laxative abuse, more commonly the induction of zombie. Now, that's not to say that um, CCK is the only causer of this um, condition known as bulimia nervosa, but uh, it could be one of the factors. So these individuals, when CCK is measured, they have lower, C C lower CCK levels after the meal. Now, interestingly enough, is uh, and other conditions are sometimes associated with uh, panic attacks or anxiety and CCK agonists have actually been shown so these are uh, drugs that mimic or and pay, uh, are agonistic to CCK they actually can be administered in some panic attack cases to have resolution 
So CTK is important in digestive physiology, but it appears there's also some neurological um, hypothalamic things that are potentially going on here as well. So um, the next hormone I want to go through is gastric inhibitory peptide, or GIP, G-I-P. So we find um, the gastric inhibitory pre uh, peptide being produced by, uh, or it's centralized to K cells. Both in duodenum. So gastric inhibitory peptides um, seem to be released from the K cells in the duodenum and in the jejunum. And then physiologically, so, okay, um, that's a, a fair question. Remember that we have um, our chromatin cells and parochromatin cells. They are cells that are distributed throughout the gastrointestinal tract. And there are um, different subtypes of these enterochromatin cells. The I cells that we just talked about are a type of enterochromatin. The K cells are another type. We also call those clear cells. So this is just a specific type of clear cell. Right, so uh, gastric in inhibitory peptide uh, physiological function. Um, clearly, its name would suggest that there's some inhibitory roles. And so a couple things that GIP will inhibit. Uh, first is what's known as gastric emptying. And so this is the stomach's ability to release boluses of uh, chime, chime into the small intestine. And so in the presence of GIP will actually prevent that process. We also inhibit gastric acid secretion. So it has some inhibitory process in the um, in the stomach's function, as its name suggests. But there are a couple other uh, a couple other functions that we'll um, observe here as well. Uh, one of those is that. Gastric inhibitory pep peptide uh, is insulinotropic. And so, what that means is it's insulin like. And so, gastric inhibitory peptide is released is released from the intestine. On ingestion of a sugary meal. And will help to potentiate levels of insulin release. So it kind of works along with insulin to a certain degree to help prevent insulin and I just call insulin right there is no it's aligned with insulin from becoming um, overly overly prompt within the within the circulation. Gastric inhibitory peptide also has some actions on some other tissues. Um, 
so in particular, I'm going to give you a, a look at adipose and uh, muscle, but also blood as well. We have some effects with the electrolytes. So um, adipose tissue, gastric inhibitory peptide increases a, a hormone, or I'm sorry, an enzyme rather, called lipoprotein lipase. So it'll enhance the enzyme's activity. Lipoprotein lipase. The lipoproteins are what are associated with cholesterol. And a lipase will break those down. In the muscle, it enhances glucose utilization. And then it also influences electrolyte content of different body organs and, and, and tissues, uh, in particular, like the blood. So what I want to finish up here with, uh, in terms of gastrointestinal endocrinology, uh, I want to take a look at uh, gastrin and secretion and DTK, uh, which are three of our more putative uh, gastrointestinal hormones. And I want to just go through their mechanisms of action. Okay, we'll start out with gastrin. So the, the image that you're looking at here, just to kind of set the stage, is you have um, a couple different neurons, and then you have G cells. You have cells that produce somatostatin. These are called somatostatin cells. And then you have some cells that, um, that uh, they're, they're parietal cells, that, but they have muscarinic receptors. Okay? So, uh, and, Acetylcholine affects both of these enteric neurons. This is a releasing a non-adrenergic, non-cholinergic post-ganglion substance. Okay, um, in particular, it's going to release GRP, gastric releasing peptide, and that's going to interact with the G cells. Over on this side, we're releasing acetylcholine. Okay, and acetylcholine is going to affect both um, the parietal cells and then also the somatostatin producing. So with gastrin, gastrin acts with acetylcholine and histamine. targets the parietal cells and from the parietal cells it results in the release of hydrochloric acid HCl. Okay, so with gastrin when we consume a meal One of the components of that meal is going to be protein. And when we have amino acids from that from that meal that end up in the lumen, we're gonna stimulate G cells and D cells. Okay, so the D cells are going to be the gastrin producing cells. The D cells are somatostatin.
Now, <clears throat> the, so you're consuming the meal, amino acids are the stimuli for gastrin and somatostatin. And then the next step in the pathway is that the G and the D cells stimulate the, can stimulate a cell type called the ECL cell. So these are enterochromaffin like cells, and they release, respond by releasing histone. ECL. And then we have these neurons from the vagus nerve, and that vagus nerve activity we have the one showing a yellow that's going to release gastin releasing peptide to the G cells. as a secondary mechanism to stimulate the ECL cells. It's gastrin. So we'll have amino acids that enter because of a meal. They stimulate the G cell and the, pri or the, the D cell. Gastrin and somatostatin are released. And gastrin and somatostatin uh, end up causing hydrochloric acid to be released. Uh, and then uh, histamine as well, OK? But then we also have the enteric neurons, the neurons of the, of the gut. And that vagus nerve activity, you have GRP, gastrin-releasing peptide, acting on the G cells. The G cells are uh, going to be stimulated to release gastrin and then also will affect the, um, the, the ECL cells, stimulate the ECL cells. And then we have this neuron from the vagus nerve that releases acetylcholine and targets to the parietal cells. And so really what I'm telling you is we have these two different mechanisms that result in the release of histamine and also we'll have the release of gastrin as well. So one from the uh, presence of amino acids and the other from nerve activity. Now with histamine, it's actually a cyclical AMP effect. With gastrin and Acetylcholine, these induce PIP2 pathways. And so ultimately, we're getting to a point where we have proteins in the lumen, and we have not only neurological stimulation, but this luminal stimulation where we end up affecting the parietal cells to release hydrochloric acid. And that hydrochloric acid then is going to be used to denature proteins for effective um, digestion. Uh, so histamine is related to vasoconstriction and vasodilation, so it's a vasodilator. Uh, 
um, but it's typically associated with like uh, increasing inflammation. Okay, so so antihistamines. Yes, correct. Right. So allergies, right? An, an allergic reaction is a reaction where there is no reason for you to have the to have the immune response. And, you know, it's a lot of times associated with pollen grains that are um, produced from flowering plants, right? So you end up being exposed to those pollen grains. Those are observed by individuals who have allergic reactions as a foreign invading particle. And so that foreign invading particle is, uh, is basically targeted as a, uh, as a microorganism, even though it's not a microorganism. And we mount these different responses. And one of those responses is for the mast cells to produce histamine, which increases blood flow, or what we call inflammation, to try to eradicate that microorganism. So that's a different effect than what we're talking about here, even though it's the same molecule. I'm just trying to figure out what it's doing. So in this case, the histamine is interacting with, um, with the parietal cells to drive towards the release of hydrochloric acid. And it's doing it through a cyclic AMP second messenger system. And then acetylcholine and gastrin, which comes in from the blood, interact with the parietal cell as well through a PIP2 pathway to also release acetyl, uh, uh, hydrochloric acid. So hydrochloric acid ends up getting dumped inside of the, uh, inside of the lumen where we just have eaten protein. That protein gets denatured, and then we have enzymes like Trypsin, chymotrypsin, pepsinogen that will go through and cut up that protein into individual amino acids so that we can actually absorb those and utilize those in, uh, in our body. Does that make sense? All right, let's finish up with uh, secretin and CCK. So secretin and CCK have two distinct receptors. Um, the receptors are either present in the pancreas, uh, in particular the acinar cells, and these acinar cells are the non-endocrine cells of the pancreas. This is the stuff that's outside of the pancreatic islets. And it induces the release of enzymes. And then you have the cells that are uh, associated with the duct. I'm going to call those ductal cells and will release bicarbonate. And we'll release bicarbonate from, um, from the ductal cells. So the model that you have up here, you can see that it's actually going to be a cyclic AMP second messenger system or a PIP2 second messenger system dependent upon the dependent upon the um, the receptor. I'm going to move that over just a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. So secretin acts through a cyclic AMP second second messenger system. The CCK acts through a phospholipase or a PIP2 pathway. The result here, the physiological things that are happening here. Uh, aren't really completely understood, but the end result is not only do you have enzymes released like pepsinogen, but also if you're in the ductal cells, it's, it's bicarbonate that's being released. Okay? So cyclic AMP for secretin, PIP2 pathway for cholecystokinin to result in enzyme release like pepsinogen or the ductal cell release of bicarbonate.
Gassenor. That would be how you saw that. No more three. Ready to move on to the pancreas? Does that sound good? Yeah, this is a different chapter. Okay, so we're going to start with here with chapter number 11. quiz covers the digestive endocrinology uh, and then we'll I think there's a, a couple questions on pancreatic function as well where did you get that information from do what I don't think that those quizzes are lined up with. Chapter 9 was definitely quiz 4. Was it not? Yes, it was. Yeah, it was like two questions. Yeah. So maybe it's 9 and 10. You guys just know you're getting no, phone. I, I, think it was. <laughs> I think it was 8 and 9. The last question was 9. Because one of them was like, what is the. The last one was about the concentration of calcium in the bloodstream. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the pancreas. Divide the pancreatic function up into two different two different functions. The first is called that I'm going to deal with is called exocrine, and this is excretion of enzymes. And so this comes um, from a tissue that's called the acinar tissue that we just that we just um, discussed just a moment ago. So enzyme exc uh, excretion, and then also bicarbonate excretion. And both of these substances are going to be 
released from the acinar tissue and sent down what's called the common bile duct. And really, up here, this is the pancreatic duct, and then this is the common bile duct. So you can see the gallbladder is here. You have input from the liver into the gallbladder, and then you have the, the, the duct leading away from the gallbladder, the duct leading away from the pancreas, and then the common bile duct um, leading into a few lines. The second type of function that we have is the endocrine function. And the endocrine function is going to be centered around these small little groupings of cells inside of the pancreas that are known as the islet. So histologically there on top um, is a st stained sample of pancreatic tissue. These are the islets. And then the darker purple would be the acid tissue. So enzymes, bicarbonate produced and released into the common bile duct. The, ex the endocrine comes from, the endocrine function comes from these, these islands or these groupings of cells. Uh, and, and they go by a couple different names. Um, kind of old school is the IFNM, which is islets of Langerhans. Where Langerhans was the individual who characterized them. Uh, more contemporary is just to refer to these as the pancreatic islets, the pancreatic islets. So when you look at the um, individual cells, you don't see a difference. But if you were to to evaluate the hormonal production from these cells, you would actually find four different types of cells of interest in the pancreatic islets. And those four different types of cells, um, two of them are going to be classified as primary, and two will be classified as secondary. So our two primary cell types are going to be the alpha and the beta cells. So the alpha and the beta cells. The alpha cells produce a hormone called glucagon, while the beta cells produce a hormone called insulin. Now, glucagon and insulin, you all know what insulin does. And because you know what insulin does, you basically know what glucagon does as well, because they are basically the opposite of each other. So when blood glucose levels increase, insulin is released to bring those blood glucose levels back down. When blood glucose levels drop significantly, glucagon will be released to bring blood glucose levels back up. So we're trying to maintain blood glucose right around 80 to 120 milligrams per deciliter uh, in mammalian species, especially humans. Now we also have what I'm going to refer to as two secondary cell types. And these two secondary cell types will be the D cells and the F cells. Now it turns out that we've already run into D cells in other organs. In fact, we ran into D cells within the small intestine. Uh, these were a type of clear cell, and they always produce somatostatin. And then the F cells produce a hormone called pancreatic peptide. Now, an alternative name for the F cells would be the P cells, uh, just referencing the, the pancreatic peptide. All right, so um, down here on this schematic, it kind of shows what the, the islet would look like if you were to identify the different cell types based off of their, um, based off of the, the, the 
hormone that's being released from those cells, and then out in the acinar tissue is where we have the ducts that lead towards the, uh, the, the pancreatic duct for the release of the enzymes and the, the bicarbonate. And actually in this figure, which probably can view it a whole lot better on my screen, you actually can see there's a, let's see here, yeah, right here, right where the arrow is, you can actually see one of the ducts um, that was preserved during section of this tissue. All right, so the generalized response that we have here for our different hormones, um, well, in particular, insulin and glucagon, kind of the, the end of the story, so to speak, is for insulin to result in a decrease in blood glucose levels, and glucagon to result in an increase in blood glucose levels. And so the question is, well, how does each hormone elicit their, their generalized response? And so I want to start out with insulin. And I want to start out with some of the chemistries, and uh, we'll take a look at insulin in its <clears throat> in its mature form okay um, so this is insulin up here on the top you can see the primary sequence and you can see that there are two different chains an a chain or alpha chain and a b chain or sometimes called the the beta chain most commonly it's alpha uh, i'm sorry uh, a chain and, and, and b chain and then you can see that we have a couple different cysteine molecules now those are sulfur containing amino acids that will create what are known as disulfide bridges to help out uh, to establish that tertiary structure of the protein. So the A chain is 21 amino acids in length. The B chain is 30 amino acids in length. And those disulfide bridges or disulfide linkages you can see that I have two that hold together the, the two chains, and then I have one that holds within the A chain. So two are going to hold the chains together. One will hold within the H. I'll establish the um, tertiary structure. <clears throat> now, when you look at um, residues seven, eight, and nine, okay, residues seven, eight, and nine. These three differ between species. So what you're looking at down here on the bottom is, is the actual ribbon structures uh, and how these two different chains, the A chain in red, the B chain in blue, are going to be held together with those disulfide bridges. So these are the, <clears throat> in humans, threonine, serine, and uh, I don't even know what that is. Isoleucine, maybe? I can't even read it on there. I think that's isoleucine in humans. Uh, it's these three that will be different. I'm not going to expect you to memorize all the different 789 resumes. Line them up with different organisms. But they are different uh, between, between different organisms. Okay, so how is insulin actually synthesized? 
It starts out as a pre-pro-insulin gene. And so already you should know, oh, okay, so we're going to have transcription, translation, and then post-translational modifications to finally get down to our actual structure. Okay? So what you're looking at here in this figure, the pre-pro insulin, you can see it's a big, long chain. To get to pro-insulin, we're actually going to pull off this terminal end, and then we're going to remove this big, long sequence here on the bottom to get our final insulin structure. Okay? So this is the whole molecule here. And you can see that I have a signal peptide, which is removed from pre to pro. I have my B chain and my A chain. And then in between, I have this thing called C peptide. And C peptide is removed to get to, to my final formature insulin. So that pre-pro insulin gene contains A and B chains. And then you have that link of the C peptide. That C peptide is 31 amino acids. And then at the very <clears throat> front of the molecule here, you're going to have the signal peptide. It's 23 amino acid residues. Now, what that signal peptide actually does, as the insulin gene is produced, it, the, the signal peptide targets the gene to the rough endoplasmic reticulum. So once it gets into the rough endoplasmic reticulum, it begins to move through the rough ER. We're going to remove the, uh, the signal. And so once that signal is removed, we now have pro-insulin. From the rough ER, it now moves into the Golgi complex. And once it's in the Golgi complex, the changes that occur here are things like the establishment of the disulfide linkages or bridges. So we establish the disulfide bonds. The C peptide is removed. And then the insulin molecule is packaged along with other insulin molecules into a secretory vesicle. And once it's packaged into that secretory vesicle, this is where it's mature insulin. So we'll come back and we'll now talk about we have exocytosis of insulin in response to um, elevation of blood glucose levels. And we'll talk through all of that process. But I want to take a look here at the C peptide. Uh, because the C peptide was actually just considered for a long time to be a fragment um, and sort of just held together the held together the A and the <clears throat> and the B chains. But there's actually some physiology that we now understand or that we recognize related to the C-peptide. So the C-peptide is not just some benign chain of amino acids. It's going to have some physiological functions.
So the C peptide <coughs> was once considered to be non-physiological. And there was actually an article that was written, oh, I don't know, it must have been about 15 years ago now. And that article basically said C peptide has made a comeback. In fact, the title of the article was C peptide made a comeback. And so all of a sudden, the C peptide was being viewed as having not just simply a non-physiological role, but some <coughs> physiological implications. And in particular, the article implicated C uh, or C peptide um, as having a role in decreasing structural changes or reducing structural changes in the kidneys and in peripheral nerves. Yeah, implicated in. So it was implicated in decreasing structural changes in the kidneys things nephrons and in the peripheral nerves think things like myelin. But also may be related to increasing blood flow, in particular to places like the skeletal muscle, the nervous tissue. In the cardiac muscle, which interestingly, all three of those issues are heavy users of glucose. It's also been suggested that C peptide was involved in increasing the number of or the density of sodium potassium pumps which would be a user or a um, stimulator of ATP production. And we all know now that glucose is an important starting point for ATP production. And then C-peptide has also been suggested to increase um, what's called ENOS. And ENOS stands for endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Which is an enzyme that produces nitric oxide within the endothelial cell and nitric oxide is very potent for the enzyme. So article comes out, C peptide makes a comeback, a um, couple implicated possibilities. Uh, there was actually some experimentation that was done with C-peptide. I want to go through that experimentation. Uh, in particular, this ex the experiment I want to go over right now was done in rats. Uh, and the, uh, the rats were measured for this thing called lumbar sympathetic nerve activity. Suggests the lumbar sympathetic nerve activity is a measure of the sympathetic at, uh, nervous system activity in the lumbar originating sympathetic neurons. I'm going to kind of summarize the results of this experiment uh, in, a, in, in a, a chart here, I guess, or a table. A 
Okay, so in this experiment, we had two different groups of rats, normal rats and diabetic rats. And these individuals were treated with insulin on its own, C-peptide on its own, or both insulin and C-peptide together. Okay. So for the normal rat, when exposed to insulin, there was an observation of an increase in heart rate and an increase in lumbar sympathetic nerve activation. The individual who was a diabetic or the rat that was diabetic, when exposed just to insulin, we saw the same thing, an increase in heart rate and lower, uh, I'm sorry, lumbar sympathetic nerve. Okay. Then when we just treated the C-peptide, there was no, no, no response. So on its own, C-peptide didn't really look like it had any sort of effect. Insulin increased the heart rate, increased this sympathetic nerve system tone in the lumbar neurons. What was interesting here, though, is when we gave both insulin and C-reactive peptide. The normal rat responded by having an increase in heart rate, no increase in lumbar sympathetic nerve activity, but that heart rate was also attenuated following, uh, 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 immediately following introduction of C-peptide. the diabetic rat, attenuation. We actually saw both heart rate and sympathetic nerve activity increase, but attenuation of both heart rate and lumbar uh, sympathetic nerve activity. So if heart rate goes up when it's attenuated, it's brought back up. And so what the idea is here is that C-peptide, even though it may not have any sort of actions on its own, when coupled with insulin, it basically alters the sympathetic nervous system tone, okay? So insulin on its own, <clears throat> both heart rate and lumbar sympathetic nerve activity, this rat has a higher sympathetic tone. It's, it's agitated, right? Same thing with the diabetic rat. So insulin actually sends these rats into kind of a state of being agitated, having that higher sympathetic tone. Nothing happened with C-peptide, and then in the presence of both insulin and C-peptide, even though you began to have this response, it didn't happen in the normal rat in, with sympathetic nerve activity. We didn't see that um, increase and then attenuate. That just remained constant, uh, low level of sympathetic nerve activity. Heart rate did increase, but it was brought back down relatively quickly uh, or attenuated relatively quickly. But there was a little bit different response in the diabetic rat. Um, there was actually agitation or sympathetic nerve system response, but then also dropped down. So the lumbar nerves acted a little bit different in the diabetic rat. So C-peptide may actually be important in helping to uh, regulate these sympathetic responses that may occur when insulin is released. And help to level. So the C-peptide apparently does have some important, uh, some important functions. All right, let's head back. <clears throat> 
to insulin. So insulin is going to be, <coughs> insulin is going to be specifically released when uh, insulin is going to be specifically released when glucose levels begin to elevate. Okay, and so the targets for insulin are going to include liver cells or hepatic cells. And we'll induce in the hepatic cell an increase of glucose uptake. And also in those hepatic cells, an increase in the activity of an enzyme that leads towards the production of glycogen. So that enzyme is in the new We're going to put together glucose molecules into this long branch chain glycogen to package them up for storage in the hepatic cells. The second target of insulin is the adipose cells or the adipocyte. In the adipocyte, we have also an increase in glucose uptake. We're going to have an upregulation in a catabolic process that leads towards the conversion of sugar to glycerol. This catabolic process actually um, will eventually lead to triglyceride formation. And then we're also going to have an increase in the activity of the enzyme lipoprotein lipase. So this increase in lipoprotein lipase activity um, the lipids have to be stored up they have to be stored up uh, in vesicles and structures that are protected when they're in the bloodstream because lipids don't play well with water and so one of those structures is called the chylomicrons And lipo, 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 lipoprotein lipase is involved in converting those chylomicrons into individual free fatty acids. So inside of the adipocytes, chylomicrons are brought in. They're exposed to now a more hydrophobic or lipophilic environment in the adipocyte. Lipoprotein lipase activates, separating out the chylomicrons into free fatty acids. The third target for insulin is the skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle. In the skeletal muscle interacting with insulin, there's an increase in glucose and increase in amino acid uptake. In the muscle, there's an upregulation of protein synthesis. There's an upregulation of glycolysis. and oxidation. So glycolysis and oxidation. However, this glycolysis, oxidation, 
uh, interaction or uh, upregulation, I should say, may or may not increase phosphorylation. In other words, we may not be increasing the production of a weak initiated to biochemical processes that eventually lead to a ATP production glycolysis and oxidation. Chylo microns. Okay, so those are the three uh, really important target tissues, diacryls, adipocytes, and skeletal muscle, but there's also some general effects as well. So insulin will have an effect on potassium homeostasis. There's an increase of potassium uptake by the cells. Now, what you need to remember about potassium is that this is the cell membrane, extracellular here, intracellular here. Potassium is usually very low outside the cell and is higher inside the cell. And so if I induce uptake of potassium by cells, moving potassium in there, this can lead towards a condition called hypo. Anemia or low blood levels of potassium. Okay. So that's just a general effect that is also observed with increases in insulin. So when we come back, we'll talk about 